No. Ayla Sakura's whispered exhalation seemed to ripple through the suffocating air of the rent and ruined makeshift prison. Behind her cerulean eyes, Ayla's very spirit was awash in a storm of emotions which threatened to tear her asunder even more than she already was. Her beaten form lay sprawled on the ground, shattered in flesh, soul left ringing in the wake of what she even now bore witness to. Looming before her were the very avatars of her worst nightmares. Darth Sidious, the malevolent puppet master behind the galaxy's most recent galactic war, and Inquisitor Tar Weiler, the inscrutable grinning monster who hailed from another universe entirely. The former's lips pulled back in that horrific expression that Ayla had learned to fear. The Inquisitor holding aloft a rapier that seemed to drip with abyssal fire. Both semblances of evil seemed so engrossed in their newfound rivalry, so locked by their mutual challenge, that they paid her, broken and inconsequential as she was, no mind at all. Ayla felt some form of gratitude for that, but the sensation was fleeting. Cast out of her the instant the two men chose to engage each other. The moment was as sudden as the arrival of an unexpected death and twice as shocking. Ayla watching as the two approached each other and paused. Weiler's weapon roiled and moaned as he held it casually in one hand, Sidious's two blood-shaded sabers humming at either side of the Dark Lord's shrouded, black-robed body. The men seemed to flicker then, like black candle flames caught in a nearby breath. And by the time Ayla realized that their contest had truly begun, the two shadows had already exchanged several empowered blows. Gusts of hurricane-like wind buffeted out from their collisions, throwing Jedi, wounded and corpses alike across the floors and into the walls. Their duel commenced with a savagery that was a study in contrasts, like a painting in which the brightest of whites clashed with the darkest of blacks. Showing Ayla shades of shadow she had never even conceived of. Darth Sidious brandished twin crimson lightsabers, their blades glowing like demonic eyes in the strange murk that was rapidly consuming the ninth floor. Tarweiler's rapier, its blade a fragment of pitch darkness that shamed even the night, seemed to consume light itself, screaming through the air with each swing, leaving black arcs of fire in its wake. You truly believe that your childish sorcery can match the might of the Inquisition? Weiler sneered, the words spat out even as his rapier clashed with Sidious's lightsabers spawning showers of malignant sparks which seemed almost alive as they flailed and flared to the steel ground. Arrogance! Ha! Ever the folly of the uninitiated! Sidious retorted, maneuvering his dual blades in intricate arcs, a graceful dance of death which shamed Ayla just to see it. My order has long mastered the mysteries of the universe. We do not need to brute force our way through it. The Force obeys, for it is our right to command it. The Sith Lord boasted, pressing his attack as he weightlessly slid and leapt about, never striking at the Inquisitor directly, always seeking to subvert Weiler's counter-strikes or offensives. The air around them surged with an invisible pressure that Ayla could almost hear. And, to the surprise of her bloodshot eyes, Sidious was doing what none of them had been able to. He was pressing Tarweiler, gaining gradual control of their mutual movement as he kept pace with the previously untouchable Imperial. Both combatants were clearly augmenting their physical abilities with techniques based within the immaterial worlds around them, empowering themselves such that the physical universe seemed to scream around them in its attempt to keep pace. 
They moved faster than Ayla's trained eyes could follow, blurs of lethal intent shattering themselves against one another, held intact through their impacts by the same forces which made those strikes so severe. Weiler's rapier stabbed and slashed with a serpentine grace, his movements winding and indirect. Like a snake's coils folding under itself, his every maneuver punctuated with a violent and sudden lurch forward. Meanwhile, Sidious' lightsabers wove a web of red, creating a wall of light that kept pace with the black serpent fang that was Weiler's weapon, catching and deflecting every blow thrown his way. Their conjoined arts of combat could have made small the likes of even Master Yoda. At least, that was what Ayla believed as she watched on. The room was buckling around them, waves of unseen power rippling and shimmering through the air, tearing open walls and rending apart the floors above them. The destruction and contortion of the space around the defeated Jedi only seemed to accelerate then, as the physicality of the contest between the two shadow beings suddenly ruptured into overt displays of their respective dark arts. Sidious bounding up to the ceiling as he absorbed a particularly brutal strike, holding himself upside down there as he extended his arms cackling and laughing as waves of force lightning unfurled from his body and rained down. Weiler did not miss a beat, dancing back, bolts of power bouncing off his blade and psychic radiance as he spun and attempted to contend physically with Sidious's arcane display. It almost gratified Ayla to see the Inquisitor be suddenly overwhelmed before countering with torrents of black fire. The hungering flames carried aloft in an explosion of psychic malevolence which drove back the Sith lightning. And again, Ayla became aware that her surroundings seemed to waver and distort as the competition between them raged on. Reality itself protesting the unnatural forces being unleashed within it. The walls caved and folded, Jedi bodies both alive and dead being swallowed up into those metal confines as the steel around them seemed to breathe and grow, expanding and morphing as if chemically swollen from the abyssal alchemies which had been turned loose here. Even away from the walls, Ayla could feel the floor buckling and churning under her, melting and reforming without the aid of heat. Her heart hammered as she looked back at their horrific duel, wondering how her order was ever meant to stand before such twisted and unknowable powers. The clashing between the two became so rapid and so fearsome that the sound of it resembled a thrum, the intensity building and building, but it could not build forever, nor did it. Sidious drove down into the Inquisitor, splitting black flames with his red swords, twirling and carried on winds of dark power as he slapped the crimson bars of his weapons against our Wyler's dedicated defense. For his own part, despite having no second weapon, the Inquisitor was not struggling to keep up, at least no more than Sidious was. Ayla watched them lock swords, watched Tarweiler kick Sidious in the chest, dropping his rapier into a lowered posture, secondary hand slapping against the back of the hilt, and launching into a rising lunge that the Dark Lord of the Sith only avoided by cartwheeling back and out of the way. It was clear by this point in the fight that Sidious knew every single form of lightsaber combat, with the possible exception of the latest form, Vapad. But where Sidious had mastered the battle arts of the Jedi and Sith, this Tar Weiler fought not with the martial teachings of two orders, but with the lethal wisdom of several hundred. Forming out of his fighting style a chaotic amalgamation composed of very nearly every single sword fighting technique that humanity had cultivated in 10,000 years of constant escalating war. It was within this melee storm of violence, this bloodthirsty exchange of galactically assembled martial prowess, that the Imperial Inquisitor eventually gained the upper hand. 
It happened so quickly that Ayla was not able to spot the exact moment that the rapier found its mark. Somehow sliding past Sidious's guard and scoring a searing line across the Sith Lord's chest. The two broke apart like powerful opposing magnets, Tarweiler grinning his monster's grin as he and Ayla watched Sidious rise from a crouch. A growing line of black flames spreading from his chest, lighting his hidden face with darkness. Now it was Tarweiler who cackled, Ayla feeling a strange despair, realizing at long last that not a single being of her galaxy could stand against the predators that had come from somewhere else. Even the Sith were ultimately no match, though one would not know it from the undaunted posture of the burning Dark Lord. Your lightsabers may cauterize flesh, but the fires of the warp consume the soul. Weiler hissed in victorious elation. You are finished! Food for the warp! Sidious looked down at the flames and grimaced, not from the wound, but from the realization that the duel had moved to a terrain where physical skill alone would not suffice to serve his purposes. His eyes glinted like shards of dead stars as he lowered his glowing weapons, deactivating them and having them vanish up the sleeves of his robes. He was preparing for a different kind of battle. Tar could see this as well, and looked upon the Sith Lord with mock pity. Unable to accept the inevitable? A shame! You will die flailing against the fate no one, not even I, can prevent now. The Inquisitor mocked. Sidious did not respond, at least not with words which Tar Weiler could understand. Instead, he seemed to look down and speak to the flames themselves, his words strange and clipped. Weiler watched, his keen mind recording every word, though even then his arrogance was supreme. The daemon fire he summoned was born of the most insatiable parts of the Immaterium. Children of a hunger so intense, even the dark gods made scarce use of it. Wielding it was to dance the line between existence and utter obliteration, and he had seen word bearers fail to coax the flames to stop. So Tar watched, watched and nothing more as Sidious spoke the hideous and lost tongue of the Balk. Masters of the Black Flame, speakers of the chaos. Tar had seen sorcerous attempts to put out the flame, to smother it, to deny it, to bribe it into release, to beg it for mercy. But Sidious did none of these. Kintik Hatsuska Otkaratak. Kintik Hatsuska Otkaratak. Jashen Sixa. Jashen Sixa. Sidious spoke, summoning control of the Black Flame. This, his communion with the Dark Side. Finishing the incantation, Sidious drew in a deep breath, and as he did, the flames were torn from his chest, entering his nostrils, and with flares of power which could be seen within his shadowed eyes, the fire was gone, and the Inquisitor was left speechless, for a moment at least. How? Tar finally managed. The flames are unquenchable! They do not relinquish prey! How? He demanded, raising his rapier and pointing it at the Dark Lord of the Sith. Darth Sidious, resplendent in his darkness, did not respond right away, shadows deepening all around him as he finished breathing in the breath he had taken. He exhaled darkness in place of smoke, his breath long and dragged out, Weiler's eyes darting, but unafraid. 
When Sidious spoke again, he did so in a deep, demonic voice that drew what little breath Ayla had out of her lungs. The dark side of the Force is a pathway to many abilities. The weak and short-sighted consider to be unnatural. Tar edged back, the air seeming to rumble without noise. He knew what this was. Just beyond the veil, on the other side of the border which protected the material plane, the warp was roiling, writhing, scratching and tearing at the seams. His beady black eyes widened as he realized for the first time that he was not dealing with anything as simple as a powerful witch sorcerer. You are strong in the dark side, said the Sith, stepping forward and dragging every shadow in the room with him. Worthy of the mantle. He purred, making the darkness around them shudder and draw in closer. What? I... Ah! Wyler began to say, before crying out, staggering, one hand holding his blade out towards Sidious, while the other suddenly clutched at his head, covering one of his hateful eyes. Ayla could feel it as well, a conduit, a powerful channel opening between them. Like water calls and connects to water, so too did the black hearts of these creatures connect and flow into one another. Yes, I can see it. Crooned the Dark Lord of the Sith. Such power you have, yet still a slave. Your chains, unbroken. He continued, stepping closer still. I am no slave! Tarweiler spat back, saliva frothing his lips as he attempted to drive apart the strange connection. I am an Inquisitor! A Lord Inquisitor of the Imperium of Man! Billions live and die by my whim! I command battle fleets and soldiers which shame anything you have ever wrought! My authority is the authority of a god! The Imperial roared in defiance. And yet, the Dark Lord said, seeming to almost whisper the words, although each syllable cut through the air like a razor blade, easily heard. It is not your authority. It is the authority of your dead god. Mocked Sidious. Silence! Snapped Tar, slashing his sword through the air to punctuate the statement. I am the greatest Inquisitor in the entire Zectech sector, and soon, the whole galaxy! The shark-toothed man railed. So you wish to believe? The Sith Lord smoothly retorted. And yet how true would that be, if the rest of your precious Inquisition knew? Said Sidious, stunning Tar with the breadth of the knowledge this connection had evidently bestowed. Knew what you really are. The Sith finished with a grin the Inquisitor could feel. The man could not be allowed to live, or know anything more, Tarweiler determined gritting his teeth and burrowing his smooth brow into an ocean of wrinkles. I am the Inquisition! The Psyker bellowed, throwing himself forward in a charging lunge. But he did not complete the attack, seeming to come up short just before striking Sidious, struggling against an invisible force. Gritting his teeth, grunting as he was frozen mid-charge, Tarweiler pressed forward with all his might, the tip of his black rapier beginning to smoke only an inch or so from Sidious's chest. The Dark Lord smiled, stepping closer and forcing Tar to slide back, the end of the rapier now glowing red hot. With a sudden burst of movement, Sidious snapped his left hand out to his side, 
The rapier, following, suddenly jerked out of Tarweiler's grip and spitting across the room to clatter against the wall. In the same instant, his right arm thrust forward right into Tarweiler's chest, exuding a force great enough to fold Durasteel, but only managing to shove the Inquisitor back about six feet. Staggered, but swiftly rising and regaining his composure, Tar Weiler reached out to his right, extending his will towards his sword, but paused then as Sidious shook his head. Why let blades decide what malevolence should settle? The Sith Lord suggested an insidious proposal which challenged Tar's most vaunted asset, his psychic might. Very well, but remember when you find yourself screaming, your soul rent apart in the tempest of the warp. Recall this moment. Remember that it was you who challenged me and brought this upon yourself. Tar said as he drew his hand back in and crossed his arms over his chest, forming an aquila, though each of his fingers was notably spread. Darth Sidious raised a hand almost daintily to his mouth and laughed. Clearly you have a talent for speaking threads, but I am afraid that now I must teach you when to heed them, said the Dark Lord, raising his hands, touching his thumbs together and forming a pyramid shape at the center of his chest. For a moment, they seemed to hold, paused, one staring the other down. But they were only still in a purely physical sense, as Ayla could feel. Behind their dark, burning eyes, the Force was splitting and being churned in a way which defiled every teaching of the Jedi. Lightning burst from Sidious like a foul raiment of destructive energy. And in response, a corona of brilliant shimmering flame exploded like twin wings from Tar Weiler's back. The fires black, but etched in a brilliant gold. A fraction of an instant later, and the duel shifted from a physical to a metaphysical plane entirely. Ayla's eyes wide and bleeding as she continued to bear the burden of the witness. Sidious unleashed phantasmal Sith illusions. Demonic constructs of the dark side aimed to disorient and terrify. Now coming closer to true life than ever before, Wyler retaliated by ripping open the very fabric of reality exposing both himself and his opponent to the roiling madness of the warp itself. Visions and nightmares clashed in a realm beyond corporeal understanding. A contest not of strength or martial skill, but of will, knowledge, and blackest insight. The Force was tearing itself apart, devouring its own body as the two men commanded it against each other and the room contorted violently, rising on contorting corrupted metal until it was no longer the ninth floor beneath the ground, but rather nine stories high into the air. A twisting and still rising tower of metal scrap that reached agonizingly towards the heavens as reality was suffocated nearly onto the death of all logic. Ayla Sakura, her consciousness teetering on the edge of oblivion, realized then the unspeakable horror of her predicament, the predicament of her entire order and republic. Compared to this power, they were all but mere moths caught between two raging infernos, each capable of incinerating not just the body, but the very essence of any caught in their way. As Sidious and Wyler continued their unspeakable contest, now a clash of forbidden lore and dark power as much as one of weapons, Ayla felt the force itself shuddering, as if in anticipation of some terrible, irreversible fracture that was about to occur. 
regardless of who emerged victorious, she understood one chilling fact. Both men were shepherds of cataclysm, architects of the apocalypse of not just this world, but countless others. Their darkness was not merely personal, but cosmic. Not merely physical, but metaphysical. And as she lay there, flinching at each crackle of dark energy, and each scornful exchange of powers entirely antithetical to her own, a final thought intruded upon her fading awareness. She, and the Jedi, had never even stood a chance. This war had been over before it started, and as despair consumed the soul of Ayla Sakura, so too did darkness consume the waking world, and she fell away, knowing no more. One of her slender hands slid across the exposed skin under her neural interface band, wicking away sweat with the act, and being forced to mentally negate the implied commands that the gesture issued to the Oracle computer system, a system that Omega was now very much a part of. Few of the previous battle simulations had pressed her this hard, and none of them, not a single one, had borne the stakes this game now held over her. Omega flicked her wrist, readjusting the assault positions of countless warships with the act. Her commands then processed and disseminated by her team. In the black, insubstantial sea of the void, Venators banked, their engines burning like dim stars in the endless night between worlds. Their weapons fired in rapid succession, a chorus of colored plasma raining like hail, splashing and shattering upon the skins of the behemoths all around them. And every few moments, one of those monsters they had warred against would swat a swathe of them out of the darkness, annihilating them with shells, cannons, and strafing lines of volatile energy. But the swarms of the Republic were many, and the gargantuan beasts of the Imperium were few. And Omega knew that she could win out with precision and ruthless application of the needed maneuvers. And so it had gone, with Omega and her many captains dueling against the Lord Admiral of the Imperium and the many lesser admirals beneath her, all of whom served as Omega's presumably simulated opponents. They exchanged blows, the ships and the steel of their bodies acting as the blades of their sabers as they dueled each other back and forth, a dozen metaphorical rapiers clashing, each held in as many arms between the two of them. Nearly an hour had passed, and already 56 different critical moments had been reached from small conflicts or skirmishes within the larger battle to heavy fighting and obviously prime priority engagements. No matter their apparent size, each and every single one of these 56 points had been situations which could change the flow of the battle and could have caused full reversals of her current momentum had even a single one soured badly enough. But Omega had managed to win or stalemate each and every single one so far, clearing her mind of all distractions seeking only what needed to be done to survive every critical encounter as they occurred, always looking to implement her larger strategy whenever she could. 
At the end of the day, no matter what intelligence she was facing, this battle, any battle, was just angles, numbers, possibilities, and probabilities. Nothing could overcome that fact. And that fact would not overcome Omega's will to see her small group remain whole. All around her, each one of the other clones that composed her impromptu family were struggling to keep pace with their young leader. A single moment, a tiny lapse, even a temporary hesitation could easily cost them 50 ships and tens of thousands of lives along with them. They all wanted to stay together just as badly as Omega. However, two factors kept them from matching the lethal speed and tactics of her moment-to-moment -moment commands. Firstly, she was simply superior. With a grasp of physics and tactics which bordered on the preternatural, Omega was so apt at reading and noticing details and patterns that even the others in her group suspected that she may have somehow been cloned as a force sensitive. With an eye sharper than a vibroblade, and a mind born of the gene furnace that was what remained of Django Fett's existence, Omega did not lack for decisiveness either, and her application of tactics was either immediately effective or quickly corrected. And yet, even with this advantage, there was something else holding the others back that Omega was not bound to. One after the other, the clone children of Omega's strategy command team came to a realization that their leader was simply blind to perhaps even subconsciously choosing to not see what they had all realized. This was not a simulation. This was real. These numbers were real. The Armada was real. The Imperials were real. And the sacrifices that they were making to keep their momentum going and their victory assured was most certainly real. Tears dripped from unblinking eyes as commands were parsed and sent, hearts beating like leaden pumps in frail chests, every beat becoming harder and harder with each callous command they issued forth. But none, not one, had the heart or the will to tell Omega the truth, or to even signal it for while parts of them died as tens of thousands perished at their orders, it was clear from the narrowness of their lead that each and every single one had been a required loss for the sake of victory. And so, Omega, unknowing, innocent goddess of death, danced and spun her strategy over the convulsing, dying masses of Republic and Imperial ships. More and more the momentum was mounting. Further and further ahead did their victory take them, and all it had cost them to this moment was nearly a quarter and a half of their combined fleet strength. Most of those lost Republic ships did not meet their end in the direct battle that was occurring even now, however, for such mass losses in such a short amount of time would have been almost impossible to manage unless she had been trying to get her units obliterated. The whale-like behemoths of the Imperial fleet circled and spun lazily in the void sea, engines burning outlines into space like vast fins of fire as their enormous weapons belched sure death into the clouds and shoals of surrounding Republic vessels. But those overpowered weapons could only be so effective when overkill earned them nothing and Omega had already adopted strategies to keep each single blast of their gargantuan guns from destroying an optimum number of her own ships. No, the true lethal threat came from the vast line of even larger, stranger vessels who kept their distance from the body of the battle. Despite that distance, their participation was no less present as they fired massive and varied weapons from their positions creating a myriad of destructive and debilitating effects across the entire battlefield. Gravitational wave bombs ripple the very fabric of space-time in a visible way. Novatic detonations exploded in fiery violence, briefly resembling stars in their expanding brilliance. 
Ionized particulate torpedoes blossomed in ways which resembled brilliant fields of blue and purple flowers in the black backdrop of the battle, creating nebulas of crippling energies which could strip the functionality from a Venator like a hurricane wind could blow out a candle. The battlefield conditions continued to change, and Omega continued to adapt. However, she did not seek out the distant, bombarding behemoths, calculating that the overall battle would be harmed by splitting her forces. Even now, as wedge-shaped Republic ships splintered and burst on waves of unseen gravitational energy, or were burnt molten in the embrace of sun-like explosions, the bleeding monsters of the Imperials began to die as well, and with each felled Imperial ship, much of their fleet strength would be bitten away. Each time an Imperial ship became too crippled by the ongoing battle or was destroyed by Republic vessels, at least two other Imperial ships would break off from their battle positions, anchor the vessel brutally with large chains, and drag it away into screaming, swirling portals of blue and black energy. Thus, breaking one vessel meant subtracting three from the battle, an advantage that was rapidly giving Omega dominance in this contest. But only so long as their concentrated fire efforts remained consistent, and they could only remain consistent if she did not split her attack power in half. So, men died and fired, killed from behind by the enemies they were forbidden to pursue. The netherworld was flushed with the dead, but Omega could not feel their presence, nor could she hear their legion. Not until, suddenly, a small red line of script appeared in the corner of her vision, in the midst of her void-born duel with the Imperium. Connection error detected. Omega barely noticed it at first. It was someone else's problem, someone else's job. That changed quickly, as the illuminating panels of hologram projectors which surrounded her began to fail. Their projected, three-dimensional screens going red and losing all detail, one after another in quick succession. The same soon occurred on the monitors all of her supporting team were working on, the screens becoming crimson sheets with the word ERROR written in white at the center. What the- Omega said, looking around in confusion. The others did much the same, with Arcanian angrily slapping his console with a wide hand to try to coax it back into function. Sprout slowly lifted his face away from the console, the blood draining from his features. Did the simulator break? Omega added a moment later, just before the lights all suddenly shut down, a deep whine in the ship walls signaling the powering down of the main engine. The clones found themselves awash in the darkness, blind until the lights suddenly came back on, another rising whine denoting the restart of the power systems as the ship came back online. No one came in for them. The door into the room did not open, and the glass observation center above them did not issue any commands, nor did its large glass window become any less opaque. Omega shrugged nervously, looking back at the projectors as they began to flicker back into life, the screens on the support consoles following suit. But even after reactivating, they were blank. Um, system response request? Manual access mode? Omega said to the computer, nervousness clear in her voice. Was troubleshooting part of the simulation test now? The holograms did not respond to her at first, before a single word written in white text appeared hovering before her. Omega squinted at the word and read it out loud. Receiving... Red Omega. Is that a bit strange? Asked Meek, the willowy clone cadet who stationed one of the lower consoles, the one to Omega's right. Yeah, aren't the system framework responses normally in a larger text? Sprout added, sitting right above Meek in one of the upper consoles. Also, it's in a different font too. Ally said from over Omega's shoulder. What are you guys whining about? Computers probably got an upgrade that changed a few things. Let's get this error worked out. You know what is happening every second, we are cut off from the Armada, right? Arcanian insisted. Arc's right. Said Omega. 
Think about it. This simulation has been more detailed and complex than any we've had thus far. I'm not even surprised the computers could not handle it. It only makes sense that they would have gotten upgrades before this game began. She explained, unaware of how her teammates cringed, all of them knowing quite well that this was no simulation, and not a single one among them with the courage or motivation to tell her the truth. At least, not yet. Omega stretched and cracked her back a little before continuing. Okay, um, system check. What is stopping us from resuming the operation? Omega commanded, crossing her arms as she waited for a response. The previous message vanished and a single floating dot appeared in the air where it had been, blinking on and off for a few moments. Then it was replaced by another response, which Omega chose to read out loud. Checking. What operation is not resuming currently? The young clone said, eyebrows askew in confusion which tainted the tone of her voice as she read the response. How can the computer not know its own operation? Ally asked, voice puzzled. Must be some kind of critical system error. Meek muttered. Do you think we can still troubleshoot our way through this? Asked Arcanian. Omega shrugged her shoulders and sighed, tapping her chin as Sprout bit his lip, a suspicion slipping serpentine and vile into his mind. Resume command and control operations over the current Republic fleet action. Omega began to say before Sprout suddenly yelled and almost fell out of his console alcove. Omega, wait! He cried out. Don't tell it anything. The young clone finished, but it was too late now. The computer relayed the amount of her response that she had already spoken, and the dot returned, blinking once more. Sprout, what's wrong? Omega asked, befuddled by his outburst, but Sprout did not say anything. Eyes nailed to his console screen, and the blinking dot he saw there, waiting for a response. And soon, the response came. Found you? Omega read, even more confused than before. She looked over at Sprout, expecting him to elaborate, but was shocked by the pained expression she found on his face. Omega, this isn't a simulation. This is a real battle against the real Imperium. And, and I think the enemy just found us. Sprout explained, and as if to punctuate his response, the ship suddenly shook violently. Omega almost fell out of her command platform and blinked rapidly, the pieces in her mind starting to form into the truth she had been refusing to see. She opened her mouth, but could not speak, tears beginning to rim her wide eyes as the profundity of her actions up to this point became clear. I'm sorry, Omega. I, I, I should have told you. One of us should have told you. B but when Nala Se chose to lie, we j just assumed... Sprout tried to explain, feeling an unexpected wetness in his own eyes. And as he spoke, the sound of Kaminoans and clones beginning to scream started to barely penetrate the thick walls of their command center. For indeed, the Imperium had found them had been waiting to find them. And now that it had, the Imperium had sent an emissary bearing the Emperor's judgment and his mercy. Lazarus stood by, waiting behind the one-way glass as he lingered in the observation room, watching as the examination was performed on the script he had been given. The long prayer scroll was covered from top to bottom in sloppy, low gothic. The terms for a ceasefire, not a surrender. Written in the blood of the Republic Witch Knight who had sent it, the message itself was barely intact anymore, picked recordings now serving as the only records of what it had once said while complete. 
Servo surgeons and skulls extended their many limbs carefully down towards the paper, slicing segments away for piece by piece testing, all while members of the Medicaid and Hospitlar who had remained worked furiously over specific segments of the tattered prayer scroll, cutting small punch marks out of the pieces where the blood had been spilled most thickly. The methodical disassembling and testing was an absolute requirement, for while the handwriting had been sloppy, the terms within were enticing enough to warrant consideration. But, for consideration to be even a meager possibility, Farnus's claims had to be verified, and further, Lazarus had to ensure as much as possible that he was not dealing with anything worse than an abhuman mutant. Already they had confirmed that the blood which made up the script belonged to a heavily altered near-human, about 2% more divergent than an Ogryn. But not quite as divergent as a beastman abhuman strain, like the Felinids. Now they were testing for everything else. Mutation, corruption, gene mimicry, and most importantly, the genetic taint of the subversive and monstrous gene stealers. Meanwhile, the other half of this message, that is to say, its bearer, Farnus Eliton, was being tested almost as thoroughly. Lazarus had chosen to oversee this instead of that, for by his own judgment, by his own reckoning, the young soldier had been telling the truth so far as he knew it, and was no traitor. Lazarus could have used his authority as a saint to spare the boy his tests. He could have vouched for him, could have said that the Emperor saw through his eyes and beheld nothing wrong with the guardsman messenger. But the stakes were too high, his own desperation for a solution was too intense, and the price of a mistake was potentially eternal. The fact that this was being considered at all was the highest form of recognition that Lazarus could afford to offer him. The rest, he would need to prove to the interrogators and psychers who, even then, were busy scouring his mind for any trace of deception or omitted truth. I cannot believe that you are actually choosing to do this, said a familiar voice behind him. Lazarus did not turn. Though it had been only a very short time, already he and she had verbally skirmished around this topic. But now, he felt she had the intention to finally hash this out. Taking a deep breath, Lazarus spoke. I haven't chosen to do anything yet, said the saint of the Imperium. The Emperor tells us that to merely consider a sin is to commit it in your heart, and you are considering this," said Leandra Ordain, dressed in a full panoply of powered armor once more, leaning carefully against the metal wall behind her, arms crossed. I am, Lazarus agreed, picking his next words very carefully, though he still did not budge. I have to. I was given a directive from your mother, and if she has succeeded in somehow stopping the virus bomb from going off, then I must continue. I cannot squander Ishtara's miracle. I cannot surrender. Not even to death, he explained. Behind him, the Canoness commander made a sour face. And you think that trusting the word of a Republic witch will somehow help you complete that directive? She asked with a frown. Lazarus's face creased as well, but not in a scowl, but rather a subtle smirk she could only barely see as a reflection against the observation window. I know that once, Ishtara herself worked with a Xenos witch, he said matter-of-factly. Leandra seemed struck by that, blinking in open shock for a few moments before gritting her teeth angrily. Elendia Sharkape, I think? It seemed to have worked out for her. Lazarus continued. That was different from this. And besides, my mother killed that witch by the end of their dealings. 
Leandra sputtered in protest. She uncrossed her arms and stood up, pointing an accusatory finger at Lazarus. How would you even know about- Leandra began to ask, cut off a moment later by Lazarus as he finally turned around to look at her, his expression thoroughly bemused. Leandra, I have been given your mother's office and records and I have been combing through them for literally anything that will help us out of this. Anything. Naturally, I looked through Ishtara's dealings with Xenos in the past, and it did not take me long to find this. It is an admittedly small file. He said with a shake of his head. And for the record, while your mother did kill the witch, it was not her plan to. The record clearly states that Ishtara was betrayed first and fought her way out, said the new saint. That is exactly my point! exclaimed Leandra, one fist slamming down into her opposite palm. You cannot trust it! If you do, this Ahsoka Tano will just end up betraying you, destroying you, and all of us in the process! She contended, almost pleaded. Was your mother destroyed by the Eldar Witch when she was betrayed? Lazarus asked back without missing a beat. No, but... Leandra began to say. And that is exactly my point, Leandra, said Lazarus, spreading his arms in mild exasperation. What do you mean? She asked, clearly puzzled by his statement. What I mean is, if I have to choose between a certain pointless, if glorious death, and an inglorious betrayal by the hands of the wicked that I may yet survive, then I choose to be betrayed and fight my way out, just like your mother did. I will not simply accept a sure death at the end of Republic Blasters, not without some victory or goal behind it. Lazarus explained. We might just be making it easier for them. She yelled back. You don't know that working with her will get us into a better position! Leandra shouted. No, I don't, Lazarus admitted, his hands out, palms open appeasingly as he silently called for some calm. However, I do know that there are not many worse positions we can possibly be in, he said. Look, I may be a saint now, but I am a soldier and a leader of soldiers, first and foremost. We have a little more than 600 men here, Leandra. When the Republic comes, if I can change or budge nothing, they will destroy us and take everything we have here in the Basilica. If I can stall them, buy more time for things to change or adjust even, then it is worth the consideration. The beleaguered saint insisted. Leandro was already shaking her head even before he had finished speaking. And all of that will still happen, and we will still die if we choose to walk into an ambush they have set! The Canoness commander continued to contest. I know, Canoness, I know! I never said it's not a risk, or that it's even likely to succeed, but from where I'm standing it's our only chance to influence the odds, even a little! Besides, me going isn't the same as me agreeing to any greater terms. And dying out there, or dying in here, at least I'll buy some time. The former sergeant explained with a resigned shrug. No, I cannot accept that! Leandra spat. It is not right that you should die first among all of us who have remained behind! She insisted. Lazarus could only chuckle at that making her snap her eyes up at him. But before she could speak, he reminded her of something that sucked the next response out of her throat. Leandra, I already have. You cannot protect me from that. His words left a silence in the air, reminding the impetuous Canoness of the fact that, between the two of them, it was he who stood at the Emperor's side, even if only for a moment, not her. Thoughts boiled behind her eyes, emotions so powerful she could use them to burn even Lazarus alive. Yet, before either could speak again, the doors into the observation room slid open. Stepping in on metal legs which clinked and clanked against the stone floor, the current representative and highest ranking member of the Adeptus Mechanicus within the Basilica cut a tall, imposing figure. 
She was the Magos Domina by the name of Aurora Sigmas, a halo of servo skulls circling her hooded head. She had lost one arm in the battle, but seemed unbothered as she stalked forward, supporting herself on a tall, ritual cog axe of the Mechanicus faith. Saint Lazarus, I have returned from the interrogation room with news and a decision. She said without preamble. The saint turned to fully face her, giving a nod of his head and quirking his eyebrows. A decision? What decision have you made, Mago Sigma? He asked. I am prepared to enforce a position as the representative of the Adeptus Mechanicus here on this planet. She explained. Lazarus's quirked eyebrows raised higher. A position on what? Lazarus pressed. On the matter of this potential ceasefire negotiation. Aurora Sigmus further clarified. Lazarus sighed heavily and rubbed his eyebrows. Listen, Magos. While I do appreciate the power of the Adeptus Mechanicus and our need for unity in this situation, if that parchment comes back clean and that interrogation follows, then I'm likely to... He began to say... Go to the ceasefire negotiation. Yes, the Adeptus Mechanicus are in favor of this course of action. She interjected. The new saint blinked, face drawn in shock. That... that was not what I was expecting you to say. If I recall correctly, you were adamantly against the idea of negotiating anything with the Republic, least of all for human lives. If you do not mind me asking, what changed your mind? Lazarus asked. In response, the tech priestess leaned her axe against the wall and withdrew a data slate from the confines of her burnt red robes. She activated it and handed it to Lazarus, who took the device and looked down to see a picked image of the scroll that the Jedi Knight had sent to them. Several lines in particular were outlined in bright green boxes. The segments in question were a part of the Republic's guarantees, which would be offered merely for attending. The Republic had captured thousands, maybe tens of thousands of Imperials during their assaults, in part because of the stun capabilities of their weapons, and in part because of the Jedi Army who had swiftly dismantled the PDF HQ. As part of the incentive for the Imperials to cooperate and attend the ceasefire negotiation, Half of the prisoners the Republic now held would be turned over, regardless of the results of the negotiation in question, so long as its parameters were kept. This had been a very large incentive for Lazarus for several reasons, but he was frankly shocked to find that it had any sway on a representative of the Adeptus Mechanicus. He looked up from the data slate and gave her a puzzled expression. Do not mistake me, Saint Lazarus, I have not suddenly developed a capacity for sentimentalism. She said to him as she reached out to take back the data pad. Then, um, what exactly am I supposed to draw from what I read? He asked her, handing it back. Twelve minutes ago, the interrogators succeeded in forcing an entire accurate recounting of events that private Farnus Leten had been withholding from his initial account of the battle. The priestess said, Oh, was he hiding something about this Jedi? Lazarus asked, but she shook her head no. He has been entirely truthful, so far as can be determined, in regard to everything he has disclosed concerning the entity known as Asuka Tano, and his brief time in Republic custody. She explained. However, prior to his encounter with the Jedi, he met with a woman of my order, a knight adept designated as Nerva Sharp. The priestess went on. Yes, he told me about her. She is one of the people set to be exchanged if we attend the ceasefire, said Lazarus. Precisely. Affirmed Aurora. Repossessing her is of paramount importance to the Adeptus Mechanicus. As such, I do not only approve of your potential decision to attend, he demanded. Nerva Sharp must be recovered. The price or risk of such a thing is immaterial. 
the priestess revealed. Leandra sighed heavily and shook her head, and Lazarus gave a small smile. Well, at least it seems we are almost on the same page, he said, making Leandra groan again. Fine, but if we are deciding to attend this blasphemous exercise in futility, then we need to determine who is going and who is staying, and what we will do if all of this turns into a trap. The canoness grated, straightening and cracking her neck. About that, I've been considering that and I think I know who I want to go with us. We must be prepared for failure or betrayal, but that does not mean we should sabotage our own chances at victory, said Lazarus. Who are you considering? Asked Aurora Sigmus. Well, the three of us, for starters, but a few others as well. Somebody find that Inquisitor, if he is still here and still alive. Also, Aurora, you just came from the interrogation rooms, right? What state was Farnus in when you last saw him? They're chewing straight through our cover, Captain! Yelled a clone sergeant who is kneeling nearby, left arm cradling a grenade launcher, right arm up and shielding his helmed face as stone chips flew and clattered against him and the others. Fordo did not respond, instead rolling his eyes inside of his helmet and hefting up the PLX missile launcher he had clutched in both fists. What the cork is it with sergeants and stating the obvious? I guess it comes with a job description. Fordo thought to himself as he prepared for a running start. Missile launcher held in both hands. A bandolier of grenades wrapped around his scorched armor. He and the clones were in the adjoining rooms that led up to the grand staircase in the center of the building, which was, at this level, a corporate headquarters from one of the planet's large distributors of mobile technology. Within, the Space Marines had set up some fortifications on the elaborate white marble stairs that led up from the center of the room, firing from tiered positions on the solid structure and preventing the forward movement of several converging clones. The room was of a hyper-simplistic design, with blank white walls of Axamite marble shot through with veins of blue so deep and thin as to appear like subtle black script in the naturally cut stone. With the Marines set up on the curving rising staircase, their field of view for the room was nearly total, something they made destructive use of, as indicated by the many red smears and man-sized clods of gore left near the entrances. The only real cover from the explosive slug throwers of the Imperial Space Marines were the walls leading into the room, and the stairs that the super soldiers themselves were perched on. And as the sergeant had stated already, the marine guns were quickly widening the six entrances that led into the room as their heavy bolts smashed and detonated into the walls. Fordo took a quick, deep breath and checked his gear once more. Explosives secured to his waist, launcher firmly gripped, he nodded and reached down with a hand, activating one of the grenades which hung from his chest. The formidable clone did not, however, take it off from the bandolier, letting the beeping sphere lie against his armor. At the same time, Fordo also finalized a timed setting on his helmet, and without another word or delay, he took off running. Flashbangs did not work on the Marines, at least not very well. Aside from being able to recover from the effects with startling speed, the Space Marines often didn't suffer the effects at all, shuttering their helmets and closing their eyes in the brief instances of the initial flashes, buying a second or two at best for those wishing to benefit from the flash grenades, but not any more than that. So the captain had devised a way of giving himself as much use as possible from those precious couple of seconds. 
He ran at full sprint into the room, timing the firing of his first rocket with the sudden detonation of the flashbang on his chest. As he had programmed, his helmet sealed, visor darkening, his ears protected from sound as much as the helm could manage, as the modified grenade burst in a shower of blinding light and sparks. The Marines, ever tracking movement and caught off guard by the maneuver, fired inaccurate shots into the glow, their barking bolters narrowly avoiding the clone captain as he, blind and deaf, ran as straight as he could manage. The rocket he had fired flew rather wide, issued forth while he himself was blind and deaf. But his trajectory was good enough to keep him on target. Marines ducked as it smashed into and exploded upon an upper segment of the stairs. The other clones drawing fire away from the insane charge of their captain by leaning out all at once and firing volleys of blue blaster bolts up into the marines. Their attack triggered by the burst of his grenade. The brilliance and relatively slow speed of the shots filling the air with further light and obscurement. When his helmet restored his vision and hearing, he found he was still dashing for his life. Heart hammering into his throat as the ground behind him was churned with fire and concussive force. Ah! Fordo yelled, feeling the chips of the shattered floor colliding with his shins as he pushed himself towards the shadows of the stairs with all his might. Muscles strained beneath his skin, some strands snapping with the force he needed to exert to stay just ahead of the stunned Marine's line of cascading death. Captain Fordo fired his second and last shot, tossing the launcher aside as the missile flew into the durable stairs and exploded, filling the room with even more dust and debris, amplifying what the first shot had already done. When he reached the other side, sliding under the shadow of the marble stairs and out of the direct view of the Marines and their guns, he did so while dragging ragged breaths into his lungs. Nevertheless, he wasted no time, scooting away from where he had arrived, sliding into an alcove created by the curving stone staircase, expecting the marines to fire through the stairs themselves to try to destroy him. To his shock, they did not, and he wasted not even a single precious second thanking his fortune or questioning their behavior as he unclipped the shaped charges from his belt and strapped them onto the base of the stairs. The explosives chimed, gravitic seals holding them tight to the stone surfaces as he primed them for detonation. The marines above Fordo made no move to intercede, for which he was grateful. Finishing his task with the bombs, the captain stood up and pressed his back against the marble of the stairs, sliding around to another spot, which was more exposed, but far enough away that he was willing to risk activating his explosives, slamming his thumb down on the detonator he held in his hand. The explosion this produced sent two molten lances of heat straight through the base of the marble stairs, shattering them and causing the structure the marines stood upon to crack and creak beneath their feet, even as they fired. The formidable Imperial warriors began to slide and lose their balance as the entire central structure of the stairs tilted, nearly tossing some of the marines to the ground. It was in this moment that the next clone press came, bellows and war cries resounding from the stone walls as the Republic's finest flooded in. The following battle was bloody to be certain, but decisive, even to a degree that surprised Captain Fordo. The Marines did not retreat, and they did not surrender, fighting to the very last amongst the rubble of the stairs. The clones took no quarter, as they had learned from their previous encounters with the Astartes, knowing full well that to pull any punches or make any underestimations would mean death and worse, defeat. The troopers bombarded the struggling Imperial warriors with missiles, grenades, and laser cannons. And what scant cover the stone rubble provided was not enough. Each marine riddled with ammunition until they finally ceased movement. All the while, Captain Fordo could not shake the feeling that something was wrong. 
The sudden change in the marine tactics, their willingness to lose men, to fight without withdrawal for goals that the clone captain could not discern. He was missing something here. And as he stared at the twitching, armored corpse of one of the half-buried Astartes, Fordo realized that whatever it was he was not seeing, it was big. Very big. So big, he might not even see it, if it were right in front of his face. Captain! Called a clone officer who came trotting up to Fordo. The captain turned to regard the trooper, who saluted and began to speak. Orders for you, sir. General Rancisis is requesting your aid. Aid with what? Fordo asked, checking his weapons, loading his grenade launcher as he spoke. He is one level below us, sir, on the far south side of the building. He was trying to reach the next level by using some construction scaffolding they found laid out on the outside of the building, but they encountered entrenched space marines waiting for them. The clone reported. The general and his forces are currently pinned down out there, but now that we are above them, the soldier went on before Captain Fordo cut him off as he grabbed a fresh PLX launcher and shoved it into the reporting officer's hands. Right. We are moving out to outflank their entrenchment and pincer them between us. Have half our force remain here to secure the area and clear this rubble. I want to be able to proceed up to the next level when the general and I return. Ordered the captain. Yes, sir said the officer, saluting stiffly for a moment before turning to do as he was bidden, still holding the rocket launcher in his arms. Less than a minute later, Fordo was moving through the hallways and passages of the corporate HQ with a train of silent, ready clones prowling behind him, most armed with something big or explosive, or both. The sounds of barking Imperial weapons grew louder, Fordo raising his fist to halt the entire column behind him. He paused to listen, hearing that horrible, thundering sound, and more distantly, what must have been the returning fire from PLX launchers and blaster rifles. He gave a quick nod, gesturing with his raised hand as he and the other clones resumed their forward march, walking a little more slowly now. A little more stealthily. They reached a unit of multi-tiered apartment blocks here, those buildings which had prioritized an outside view, and Fordo raised his fist once more. He looked around, noticing several avenues to approach from, scanning his helmet from right to left, seeing multiple doors which led to multiple hallways that ran in the direction they were heading in, some slightly higher or lower or leveled. Fordo changed his raised fist, extending all five fingers before pumping his hand twice. The clones behind him organizing into five even groupings in rapid response. He wiggled his thumb then, before making a fist with two fingers extended and pointing at a narrow maintenance crawl space. The leader of the first group nodded, making a quick gesture with his right hand, high for the others of his unit to notice. Before proceeding forward into the space, the men behind him following smoothly in tow, Fordo raised his hand again, extending all fingers and wiggling his pointer finger before making another fist with two extended fingers. He used the two fingers to gesture towards a door which led into a hallway at the far end of the room, and again, a trooper nodded, signaling for his men in the second group to follow and heading that way. And so it went, Fordo rapidly deploying each group into a different approach, until at last, it was only himself left, and the fifth group, his group. He raised a pinky finger alone, not bothering to wiggle it, as he curved his wrist twice, the clones taking his meaning and following after Captain Fordo as he took the central, most direct route. The lighting in the corridor was patchy and damaged, leaving illuminating stripes of white between the motes of thick blackness that the clones and their glowing visored helmets passed through. Doors lined either side, luxury apartments for the executives. The wide spacing between each door alluding to the amount of room each one contained within. Finally, Fordo stopped, 
holding up a fist to halt everyone else, several fists rising in the line behind him to help the order silently carry itself further back. The sound was veering away now, and the captain judged it was time to head for the true side of the building. He flicked through a number of gestures over his head, directing more squads of troops to split off from his force and line up along the doors in the hallway on one side. He knelt next to his own, gave the execution gesture to trigger the advance, and tried to open the door in front of him. It was locked, but that did not halt him. As a long, customized vibroblade slid out of his knuckle guard, humming gently as he inserted it into the crevice between the door and wall, and sawed it through the door locks. Once done, the extended murmuring blade folded back in, and the captain pushed the now limp portal in to one side. Fordo and his men stalked forward, visors glowing like Predator's eyes in the dark. The large, sweet-like apartment had a living room with a high ceiling, with three floors beside the living room, connecting it through a kitchen and a bar area, or hanging indoor balconies. Fordo fanned his hand to the right, sending several men towards the tiered floors, ensuring nothing unpleasant was waiting for them there. In the meantime, Fordo and the rest of the men in the squad he was leading continued straight onward through the living room, carefully checking around the small stairs in the den and the rich furniture and piano-like instrument which dominated one side of a dining area. Their destination was the wide balcony which awaited them opposite the door they had entered, but just before arriving there, a tap on Fordo's shoulder had him turning as one of his troops directed his attention silently up to one of the indoor balconies that connected into the larger living room. Standing up there was another trooper who made a circular gesture with one hand and then extended three fingers with the same hand. The information conveyed was that they had found three civilians. Fordo quickly made a pumping backward gesture with one hand and then extended one finger communicating for the civilians to be evacuated out of the area by one clone. The trooper at the balcony saluted and turned away. With another gesture, Fordo and his men silently slid open the glass balcony doors, the sounds of battle flooding into the space in the form of the barking of bolters and the echoing screech of blaster fire, all occasionally interspersed with the boom of explosions. Creeping out and peeking down, the clone captain found that they had arrived in the right place. Below him, by about 20 feet, was the battle itself. The marines nested on a wide platform built into the construction scaffolds. They were firing from behind cover they had created from the building materials that had been there before, standing in small clusters as they fired down at the forces of Opo Rancesis. He and the clones of his army were desperately firing back to try to keep the heads of the space marines down. But even now, the clone captain could see that the losses were mounting for their side, with pathetically few to show for the Space Marines. The area the Astartes were occupying had been meant to receive physical materials, and so was wider and sturdier than the other structures around it, making it the perfect place to force back anyone attempting to use the scaffolding to ascend higher into the building. However, it was exposed from above, where Fordo and his troopers currently were, and soon, the captain saw that he was not alone. In other balconies to his left and right, and crouching in the scaffolding behind the Astartes, as well as leaning out from the maintenance hatches around them, he could see the rest of his brothers were in position as well, and they were waiting for him. This time, he did not use a hand sign. Instead, his grenade launcher in both hands rising from his cover. Shadowing his movements, the troops around and behind him and in other balconies rose with their own weapons, less than a second behind Captain Fordo when he pulled the trigger on his launcher. Missiles, grenades, and blasters of laser cannon quality fell from the upper levels of the massive superstructure and directly into the clusters of space marines below. The Astartes barely had time to register the new attacks and react before the clones behind them charged as well, 
roaring and firing as they came. Needing no synchronization thanks to Oppo Rancisus' battle meditation, their timing was perfect. Rancisus' forces closing in at the same moment, clamping down on the marine hardpoint from three different directions. This time, the vaunted super soldiers of the tyrannical Imperium lasted only seconds, drowned in heat and explosions, the last three breaking from their firing line to charge the oncoming clones, all of them felled in quick succession by the humming blades of the Jedi General that led them. Yet, in the face of this even greater sudden victory, Fordo felt no elation, no true sense of victory. Something was nagging at him. In fact, several somethings. Concerns that his warrior's subconscious had recognized, but his present mind could only grasp at. Captain! Asked a wizened alien voice. Fordo looked up and saw that General Rancesis and his forces had reached the building proper, and that the Jedi had sought him out as he ruminated on the balcony, waiting for their clones to regroup. General! Said the captain, snapping a salute. I'm sorry, sir. I was just, just thinking, sir. He reported. The old Jedi Master raised a thickly furred eyebrow at that, and extended one of his four arms, rubbing his chin. Is that so? Why not tell me about those thoughts? The Master pressed. It's, it's nothing, General. Really, I haven't got anything more specific than a bad feeling. The clone began to say before being cut off by a wave of Rancesis' hand. I insist, Captain, the Jedi said in response. Fordo paused then to gather his thoughts, giving a sharp nod before continuing. Right, like I was saying, sir, it's nothing precise, but... The clone started saying, But... Rancesis pushed. But something isn't right about all of this, sir. Fordo managed to say, Oh, what isn't right about this? We entrapped them, destroyed them. The Jedi countered. Yes, but why did they let us? Fordo said suddenly. How do you mean? I do not think they had much of a choice if they wanted to stop my column's advance. Asked the Jedi. Yes, but what I mean is, why did they want to stop your advance? Why here? Fordo began to explain. We've been chasing the Marines up this tower, exchanging fire with them all the way up. We are getting close to the top, but there are still plenty of floors, and we've seen how careful they are with their engagements. So what made stopping you here so important? The clone captain elaborated, looking down at the shattered remains of the space marines as they spoke, most covered in the debris of their own impromptu fortifications. Go on, captain! The Jedi Master coaxed, and Fordo obliged. We already took control of the floor they were preventing you from accessing, and they must still have access to their own comnet. We have no proper countermeasures in place to stop or jam it after all. So they should have known, should have known to pull back, like they have been, should have known that they would be surrounded if they stayed in place. The captain said, gesturing down at the broken remains of the Imperial holdout. And it's not just that their placement and holdouts made no sense. They aren't the same anymore. I don't know if they are just sacrificing the old soldiers or the new recruits, but space marines are dynamic, mobile. These marines only ever tried to engage in melee after it was clear that their position was hopeless, yet they waited until the last second to charge the line. Fordo shook his head as he spoke. They know we are ill-equipped to deal with them in close quarters, and they know we cannot fire PLXs or toss grenades at them while they are in amongst our forces. Jedi are the only effective counter, and you are the only lit saber in your front line. They should have charged you the instant they realized they were surrounded, and they didn't. I don't know how to explain any of that. The clone concluded. Hmm. Neither do I, and you are not the only one to notice. Perhaps someone else on our side has done something to scramble their command or cohesion. But that is, in honesty, not the sense that I get from all of this. The Jedi Master concurred. We keep rushing ahead, trying to pin them down, trying to press their backs to the top of the tower. But I am starting to wonder if we may not be progressing into a trap. The Republic General admitted at length, but 
by that time, Fordo was no longer listening, having spotted something odd as he looked down upon the bodies of the Space Marines. Hold on, General. The clone said, excusing himself as he ran off from the balcony and around to where the upper scaffolding connected to the floor he was on, making his way rapidly to where the Marine lay. The Jedi slithered behind him, more than a little curious as to what had pulled the clone's attention away from their conversation. What do you see? Oppo asked as Fordo went to kneel beside one of the damaged Space Marine bodies. Fordo did not answer right away, examining the scene under him carefully. The right arm of this Marine, or at least the armor of the right arm, had been blown clean off by a few concurrent detonations. Left in its place was what Fordo had, at first, assumed was the shredded remains of the Marine's arm underneath, but upon closer inspection, Fordo could see that the arm was mostly intact, and it was utterly wrong. General, uh, look at this Marine's arm. Isn't it a little small for a space Marine? The clone asked. Opo raised himself a bit on his tail for a better look, and after a moment of rubbing his bearded chin, nodded. Yes, perhaps a smaller space marine. The serpentine alien offered, but Fordo shook his head, bending over the marine's helmet, modified vibroblade unfolding from his knuckles. Too small for a space marine, I think. Was the clone's response as he cut his way through the seals in the marine's helmet, yanking on it a few times before it came loose and made breathless both men who observed what lay beneath. Staring back up at Captain Fordo, open eyes glossy and dead, was his own face. The face of a Republic clone. What? Oppo hissed in shock, recoiling, and though Fordo himself did not budge or flinch at the sight, a cold sliver of sensation slid into his guts and up his spine, every hair on his body standing on end. Traitors! The Jedi Master tried to rationalize, but Fordo shook his head, noting the large neck wound the clone had, a wound which was not reflected in the armor. Decoys. Fordo corrected. But how? The Jedi asked as he leaned in again. As he did, Fordo was already on the comms, hand to the side of his helmet. Lieutenant Trigger, I need you to do something for me right away. I need you to cut the helmet off one of the marine corpses you have down there and tell me what the face inside looks like. Don't ask. Just do it, trooper. The captain ordered before he turned back to the Jedi Master. I suspect these are our own men from this fight. They must have taken corpses from us at some point in the chaos. It would not be difficult. As for how they are moving, look at these suits, General. They are completely mechanized. They probably do not need any extra help from the wearer to move around and carry themselves. Just likely not as agilely or as smart as they would otherwise. Captain Fordo deduced. So, we haven't been fighting the Marines this whole time. Just their automated armors. Asked the Serpentine General. Fordo shook his head. No, we have definitely been fighting Space Marines for the majority of this time. I would know. I killed one. There was a monster inside that helmet, and like I said, they move very differently without Space Marines inside. No. No. General, I think this is recent. The captain informed, before tilting his head to the side, receiving a message on his comm. Recent and not unique. Foro added a moment later. They pulled this stunt with me as well, further ahead. Something is happening, General. They didn't switch tactics for no reason. The clone asserted, looking around warily. Yes, but what reason could they have to hold us here, to stall? Asked the Jedi General, but he was not answered by his captain this time. In place of Fordo's voice, the screaming engines of several departing Thunderhawk gunships and variants answered the question of Opo Rancisis and slowly began to answer an unspoken question of Captain Fordo's. Ah, a cover for their retreat. Having deployed their artillery strike, their purpose must be concluded. The Jedi said as he watched the booming departure of the many, many ships, shading his eyes with one of his larger arms. But 
Captain Fordo did not buy it for a second. No, General, they never retreat. Not like this. Said the clone captain, and Oppo's face stiffened at the sound. No, no, Captain, they do not. Was the Jedi's reply, the same sinking realization falling upon him as well. They both exploded into action then, each acting very differently. Opal Rancisas withdrew his holodisc with a snap pull of the force, the object flying into his palm from his robes. He activated it. All gunships, converge on the towers and begin evacuating all forces from the- He began to order frantically, but was cut off by the actions of Captain Fordo. The captain had slipped off his grenade launcher, tossed aside his blaster, and then turned towards his general. Without warning or preamble, the clone tackled the large Jedi right in the chest, throwing himself against the stunned form of Opo Rancisas and tossing them both off of the scaffolding and into the yawning pit of Axum's nearly bottomless expanse. Fordo clutched the Jedi tight, holding their falling, tumbling bodies together even as the bone-rattling shock waves of the detonating Melda charges passed over them, tossing the two like leaves in the wind. Fordo did not see what occurred on the Axumite Tower, too busy staring downward, using his body to ensure that he and his general were aerially maneuvered out of the way of any platforms, roads, or obstructions. The clone captain knew well that if he did this correctly, the gunships would have at least 10 minutes to catch them out of the air, with the hardest part for him being staying conscious after the shockwaves had passed. But the Jedi general he carried down with him had his eyes fixed onto the tower as they fell away from it. Wide spheres watching what happened next, soul sundering as he felt the depths of his precious clones through the connection of his battle meditation. The massive, ship-caliber Melta charges fired molten-hot streams of superheated material downward, boring enormous holes through the centers of the besieged and occupied buildings in mere milliseconds. Then, an instant afterwards, superheated winds and force snapped out from those entirely burnt-out cores. The windows and all of the affected structures blowing outward to form a dazzling mist of shards around each one. And even as these glittering shrouds were formed from the draconic exhalation of the charges, the structures themselves began to rapidly sink inwards towards the gaping, molten cavities which had been left within them. No! Opo Rancisis lamented into the howling wind around him, bearing cruel witness to the efficacy and utter lethality of the tempered hands and their strategic withdrawal. The dark contest only intensified as Ayla's eyes closed. The dynamic functioning as though the contestants, subtly relieved from the pressure of the stage, were now free to unleash their most profane performances in the absence of an audience. The very fabric of the immaterial realm, itself composed of a tapestry woven with the stuff of souls and unfair fathomable powers, oscillated like a disturbed sea, churned in the wake of the Dark Lord and the Lord Inquisitor's confrontation. Two battles waged simultaneously, a war fought by flesh. Here, atop the twisting tower rising from the corpse head of Axum, and a war of minds and spirits projected onto the sea of souls like a foul, shared nightmare. But this was no dream, and the consequences of their ephemeral duel were by far the most relevant between the two. Tar's body collected his weapons, Sidious's mortal form revealing his twin sabers once more, 
throwing all they had at one another, launching themselves like foul lances, each angling for the destruction of the other. After images blurred the air as their speed and ferocity intensified, the gathering force of their dire contest signaling to all who could hear by emanating thunder in the aftermath of each clash. Storm winds sang and swirled around them, churned into existence by their movements, and more than anything else, their eldritch teachings, one colliding with the other. And yet, in spite of the great skill of their martial dance, it was not in the material world where the heart of their private war was waged. Indeed, the magnificent skill they displayed in swordplay was but the physical shadow cast by their more intense battle, a duel which was conducted in the invisible, roiling tides of the Sea of Souls. A sea they were fast befouling with their ever-burgeoning displays of black might and forbidden knowledge. It was into this realm that the Inquisitor funneled most of his power, for it was within the warp that his soul was strongest, especially without an ever-present horde of daemons waiting to prey upon him. Tarweiler's metaphysical essence radiated out from him like the glow of a dark, malevolent star, a power he tamed and channeled, his spiritual avatar becoming the semblance of a writhing serpent, its body swelling and sprouting limbs until he was a draconic, many-armed monstrosity, each hand wielding an eldritch artifact Representations and manifestations of dark desires and hidden fears he hardly dared to articulate, even to himself. Across from him, upon the warped battlefield presented by the netherworld of the Force, the spectral form of the dark Jedi sorcerer counterpoised Weiler's obvious might with a display of mystique. Far from a single, solid shape, the Dark Jedi Master manifested himself as an ephemeral wraith of shadow, shrouded in an impenetrable mist of dense illusions. As Tar made to approach, an ethereal cascade of spiritual replicas erupted into existence from the body of the strange Republic warlock, sprouting like dark flowers blooming forth in time-lapse. The countless clones surrounded Weiler's avatar in a labyrinthian forest of deception, and he lashed out through them. Immediately, he could see they were insubstantial things, hardly worth the strength he put into striking them. Tar, focused, tried to narrow his view to ferret out the black specter which held the true location of the soul he wished to sunder. Yet, no sooner had he disregarded the threat of the replicas than he found himself under attack from a torrent of sorcerous assaults. Blasted with warp lightning, the many-armed monster that was Tar Weiler thrashed, destroying several surrounding clones, but the illusions only laughed at his efforts. Rage spilled into Tar Weiler like an insidious internal bleed. The powerful Psyche recoiling from the scalding power which had been thrown into him. These cruel phantoms were designed to disorient. Their laughter and maddening whispers aimed to deceive and distract Tarweiler. And all the while, he remained the target of an unseen fusillade of psychic daggers. Each sparking blade hidden among the myriad false forms which the bizarre Jedi Master had conjured. The psychic terrain around Weiler had become a treacherous maze, and despite how powerfully or skillfully he cast out the net of his perceptions, he could not detect the true Dark Lord from the many facsimiles, each sorceress phantom lashing out, seeking to strike at his very soul. The vast majority were far too impotent to do anything but appear hostile, but among them, the true Dark Jedi danced diving in like an opportunistic scavenger at every presented opening. Strike after strike, the Imperial Inquisitor began to feel beleaguered, encircled by a suffocating snare of illusions which negated his superior strength by enabling the Dark Lord to avoid a direct confrontation with it. 
The eldritch trickery of the vile sorcerer twisted the warp around them, and as Tar's many arms rose and fell, chopping and cleaving at the army of illusions, he found that the actual foe he faced had made himself as mercurial and elusive as a wisp of smoke caught in a gale. Enough! thought Tar Weiler, fortifying his resolve and drawing in his many limbs. His psychic avatar dripped with a rage that bordered on insanity, ashamed to be so tested and confounded by a weakling of the Republic. If this dark lord of the Jedi sought to bewilder him and confound him into defeat, then Weiler would answer those deceptions with a calamity of his own. He braced, his form swelling as the army of fell hissing ghosts around him stabbed and scorched him. Ignoring the real damage amidst all of the illusions as he reached up with all of his many arms. The deceptive sorcerer sought to make the Imperial lose himself in a maze of mind traps and snares. But Tar categorically refused to play that kind of game exhaling a torrent of power into the space around himself. Flexing his colossal psychic strength, he unleashed his raw, unbridled power into the warp. His avatar, now a towering colossus, opened each hand it had raised, dropping every weapon it had sought to wield, and from its open palms blasted prismatic torrents of arcane fire. The power of his mind soul gushed out like maddening, malevolent rivers of energy, churning the spirit sea around them into a boiling tempest. The very flesh of the force itself convulsed under the assault, the fabric of the barrier between the material and immaterial tearing open to reveal rifts that bled into the sky above. A kaleidoscope storm of ever-changing otherworldly colors. As the warp roiled and bubbled under Weiler's truly titanic expression of power, a wave of it swept out from him. The false replicas of the black-robed sorcerer disintegrating as it passed through them. Each spectral phantom burst into a rain of ephemeral ashes. Obliterated by the cascading tsunami of psychic force, Tar was pushing out. Within moments, the labyrinth of shadowy deceptions was no more, leaving only the very real witch lord in its wake, his wraith-like form exposed amidst the settling warp. Inquisitor Tar Weiler inhaled the heady ether of the spirit world his avatar suddenly shrouded in billowing plumes of obsidian smoke. The form of the black-clad sorcerer raised his shadowy hands, casting forth twin branching columns of force lightning. The obsidian shroud of smoke caught the reaching, scratching claws of the rare witch's ruinous power. The lightning intermingling with the black clouds, but failing to reach the man behind them. The grin on Weiler's serpentine lips flared wide as he burst through the smoke and sparking powers of the Dark Lord. Leaping towards the unusual Jedi, arms outstretched and prepared to flay him as the sorcerer stood before the encroaching form of the Inquisitor's avatar. The Dark Lord was a mere shadow against the stormy backdrop of the warp, and yet... That shadow almost gave Tar pause, if for no other reason than from how inexplicably and relentlessly vivid it seemed to be. The Inquisitor's opponent was so dark, so solid, that he seemed a void. One Tar began to doubt his attacks could reach. The suspicion proved itself prophecy, as Weiler lashed out wildly, his claws and weapons failing to scratch the sorcerer, for it was not the witchling lord that he was attacking. Serpent eyes almost crossing, the demonic shape that Tar Weiler had taken for his own moved to the left and realized that he had been fooled. The potent sorcerer, having literally twisted the backdrop of the warp, 
to cast his own silhouette upon the horizon, and into it he had fled and vanished. Tar roared, quaking the spirit realm, knowing that the perfidious sorcerer remained near, a fact proven by their still ongoing physical contest. Casting soul-born eyes across the shifting, cloud-like landscape which surrounded him, Tar desperately sought the dark essence of the Witch Lord, but as before, he could not find it before it was ready to strike again, emerging from his own shadow to lance a blade of lightning through his body, an act Tar repaid by smashing his colossal fists into his own shadow. But by then, the Dark Lord had vanished back into it and was gone. Time and time again, Tar was finding his power and techniques blunted by the endless diversions. The Republic Warlock was able to place between himself and the Inquisitor. Grimacing with resolve, Tarweiler's monstrous spirit form reared. Psychic membranes of the netherworld rupturing as he did, clouds exploding into flame and changing colors all about him. This Jedi thing thought he could hide in the Inquisitor's own shadow? Tar could see the logic. For the darkness the Imperial harbored was the equal of any light within the Imperium he served and that served him. So he, in place of reaching in to root him out, destroyed the shadow utterly, roaring with a mind throat wide enough to swallow several men whole as he burst into radiance. His shadow snuffed as he became the center of his own glow. The Dark Lord was caught by the sudden change, thrown roughly from the once shade of Tarweiler's heart and cast tumbling through the warped space their souls occupied. The sorcerer landed roughly, rolling, body expanding, form shifting into an arachnoid shape, his spectral appendages reaching out to right himself, weaving crimson webs of devious complexity as he leapt and tumbled eight legs in constant motion. To Weiler's surprise, the warp seemed to obey him, the tumultuous energy curling and spiraling in resonance with each thread the transformed Witch Lord wove. You'll not catch me in your traps twice! Snarled Tar, his avatar form fluctuating, once a monster, then a dragon, then an amorphous cloud of teeth and jaws and flaring eyes. In his new, storm-like form, he unleashed a hurricane of screaming black bolts towards the deceptive web that was, even then, being wrapped to surround the Inquisitor. The sky was seared with bursts of undulating warp energy as Tarweiler sought to express the extremity of his power once more, throwing out attacks in every direction. The Midnight Sorcerer, hidden once more, smirked within the shadows, shrouding his soul, which lounged easily within, bearing little fear and no trepidation as he watched on. His webs folded inward like a crimson, collapsing star, catching and swallowing the doom bolts and turning them into shimmering dust and bright blue warp fire. The insidious strands were now revealed to be twice as numerous as the Inquisitor had expected. For, paired with every glowing crimson web, had been a hidden thread, invisible in the light cast out by Tarweiler's shadow-eating brilliance. The rending webs closed, entrapping the Inquisitor, using his own strength his own warp might to crush and destroy him. Yet, Tar Weiler was no novice, nor even a master. He was a prodigy, born to walk the warp, and sweating blood from a myriad of inhuman eyes, the Inquisitor managed to counter his own previous power with something greater. Eyes still bleeding radiant blood, each one growing wider and brighter every moment, Tarweiler became a spinning star of bladed light and utter brilliance, 
countless streams of silver, solar radiance pouring out from him in cascades which collided with the glowing walls of eldritch webs. Those brilliant rivers clashed and screeched against the enclosure of crimson light that the Sorcerer Lord had set upon him. The powers resisted each other, Tar preventing himself from being unmade by the trick, but still held in place, pinned like a superheated ball of silvered steel upon wraithbone webs. The witch's voice echoed out as the Inquisitor struggled, words forming from the bleak array of warp shadows that surrounded them. Inquisitor, your strength is impressive, but it becomes your weakness when you wield it so brutally. And worse, it makes you predictable. What good is light when you are so bright that you are blinded by it? Mocked the dark master of the Jedi, braying his words like a demon hidden in the mists of Tar's own mind. Tar Weiler roared his response once more, his bladed son Avatar quaking with the sound. The wretched heretic smirked, knowing that he had the Inquisitor in a snare that would cost him much to escape, no matter how he raged. He knew this until Tar made him know differently. The bellow let loose by the Inquisitor did not end. It only magnified, increased, and stretched out. The warp trembled. The dark side squealed like a rabid beast suddenly struck. And the dark master felt his smile dry out and die on his fanged lips as the bladed radiance of the sword sun Tarweiler had become grew bright and brighter. Its light and touch composed of countless, ephemeral and invisible silver razors. Lifting his right arm to shield himself, the sorcerer hissed and fell back and away, shreds torn from his form before he could slink into darkness. Tar's expression of power soared, reversing the snare's strength and breaking it. The webs shattering like blood-colored glass threads, the silver sun expanding before, fading, revealing Tar Weiler, not as a monster, a star, or even the man he appeared to be in the flesh but as the man he actually was. His masks torn away by the breadth of his struggle, Tar heaved breaths into his chest and scowled, lines drawing deeply across the natural human visage of his ordinary face. Anger welled up in the Inquisitor like blood pooling in his heart. Realizing that each strike made by the dueling sorcerer was a calculated mockery, a lesson intended to teach him futility. The heretical Jedi was able to hide his presence in the warp so well that it was blatantly shocking. For while Tar had faced more powerful psychic entities before, the list was not extensive. And this kind of power should not have been the kind that could be casually hidden. This blasphemous psyker felt like he should be weaker than Tar in every way. And yet, through the odd breadth of his technique and the strange way in which the witch interacted with the Force, the Dark Lord had not only been able to survive, but to truly contend with him. Standing before one another, physical bodies and souls met and overlaid. Tar snarled hideously at the sorcerer, who stood still and straight, face shadowed and unreadable, with an incantation that spat in the face of both the warp and the laws of real space. Tar Weiler began to speak raising his hands into a spread-fingered aquila over his chest. Libara Diabolus, Imperius Ignis, 
His voice resonated to the warped reality they themselves were twisting, his words tearing the scant tranquility asunder like the last scream of a Drukhari slave echoing into nothing. The phantom threads of the spirit world convulsed as a cavorting maelstrom of black flames surged into life, bursting from the cloudy, mostly shrouded ground they seemed to stand upon. The torrents rushed up, a perfect circle around the Inquisitor, rocketing into the sky and arcing down, honing in on the Republic warlock with cataclysmic intent. The Dark Lord, exuding an air of indomitable arrogance, thrust out his clawed hands, waving them back and forth as he rasped an incantation in the gravelly tones of ur Ketat. Huzrat Zol Talaz Manuta, Nuta Fallen Ra. He hissed, forming an arcane triangle with a sharp flick of his wrists, hands coming together. The flames recoiled and metamorphized into a vibrant tempest of crackling lightning, arcing menacingly back towards its creator. The dark side's poetry is written into every shadow you wish to bend to yourself. And of the two of us, only one is the Dark Lord. The Witch Lord taunted, reveling in the symphony of Dunmok, a song he continued to sing. But Tar was far from cowed, lines creasing his human face. Folding his hands over his chest in a proper, close-fingered aquila, he began to chant hastily. Salvatri turnum in persene! Vestre lumine protagum! As he finished speaking, he knelt down and bowed his head, a halo of resplendent light searing into life over him, and then expanding violently and rapidly around him barely shielding the Inquisitor from the onslaught of rechanneled warp energy. It was a precarious barrier, trembling under the malevolent craftsmanship of the Republic Warlock's magic, and Tar's own subverted power. Gritting his teeth, his normally black eyes alight with the hues of red and yellow, Tar's form undulated wildly, strained, but ultimately emerged unharmed for the most part. He snapped his hands forward, forming esoteric symbols between his fingers, moving them precisely through the air. Your words tire me, Jedi! Tar yelled, boiling with warp-infused wrath. He opened his mouth and began to speak, unleashing another potent expression of his stolen sorceries. Demonus Kasa! Armana Senatora Eternus Tenebrissa! He left his mouth open after the last syllable left his lips, and from his gaping maw erupted long arms ending in spindly fingered hands. They reached down, grabbing his face and shoulders and using them as leverage to pull themselves entirely free of his mouth and throat. Each shadowy, streaming monstrosity lurching towards the odd Jedi, each becoming bolts of pure warp energy as they did, each screaming missile a microcosm of impending soul annihilation. Remaining unflinchingly calm, the Archwitch raised his hands, geometric gestures forming between them. In the archaic bulk tongue, the voice of the Shadow Masters and Chaos Callers, he began to direct the world. Gratok Oslictos in La Siratatat. He said, his hands spinning intricate sigils in the air more and more rapidly, and as he did, time seemed to move more and more slowly. Becoming sluggish in the air, the missiles revealed their profane shapes more distinctly as they were brought to a near halt by the sorcerer and his continuous chanting. His words never letting up, he pointed to one and then 
to another, and then pointed to a place in the air. Time resumed in full for those two missiles, but they veered away from him, both flying through the same point in the air at the same time and colliding. The two living warp weapons destroyed each other in the collision, and soon so too did all of the others as the Dark Lord, chanting all the while, pointed at more of them and then sent them flying into different places around him in the air. The last one, which had no partner to collide with, he chose to absorb, and with dark artistry, the Witch Lord melded the screaming pseudo-spirit into a spiraling vortex of chaotic energy between his palms, toying with it like one might with a trained mouse. The vastly powerful sorcerer grinned malevolently at the power before gripping it with a sudden turn of his wrist and snuffing it out. Impressive. Tar Weiler admitted, his eyes locking on to the Witch Lord's own, which shimmered with a molten, malevolent luster. I had no idea that your Republic held such masters of the warp within it. You are nothing like the other Jedi. Even their mightiest could not have matched me like this. The Inquisitor elaborated, chest heaving as he took deep, steadying breaths. The Dark Lord's face twitched at the words, standing across from him, though he took in the praise readily, his hidden existence making the recognition of his skill and power a rare enough thing especially among other users of the dark side of the Force. That said, he took no pleasure in being conflated with the Jedi. Inquisitor Wyler, your power swells like a raging storm, a near-elemental force, and you do not wield it without skill or training. But your former masters have failed you. Your potential remains unrefined. It could be so much more. You could be so much more if you entrusted yourself to the teachings of a true master. The sorcerer purred, the tonal harmony of his voice contrasting sharply with the churning energies of the warp that surrounded them. Around and behind the two, the mists and clouds of the netherworld slowly spun lighting from within and without with energized streams of purple, red, and blue lightning. These demonic discharges echoed with the crack and howls of more than just thunder. But none of those noises or displays could distract the two dark masters from each other. And I suppose you would be such a master. Tar asked with a hideous, humorless laugh, his soul-born avatar shifting back into the appearance he currently held in his mortal life. Do not fool yourself, dog! I would rather extract your teachings from your screaming throat than hear them from your lying, placating lips. Meager words will not shift me, and they will not win you this losing war. Tar retorted. The Witch Lord nodded, shrugging. Spoken truly enough. Yet words are such intriguing devices, aren't they? They can shift the tides of wars even if they cannot win them. Alter the course of destiny even if they cannot alone direct them. The Sorcerer explained. Why don't we pause this confrontation for the moment and explore the other weapons at our disposal? Our words. The Inquisitor paused, hesitating at the suggestion. Unless, of course, you fear my meager words might actually defeat you. The Witch added with the hint of a wizened grin beneath the shadow cloak of his raised hood. Tarweiler scowled, though he inwardly welcomed the brief hiatus. Although the ways of the Force were unfamiliar to him, 
The dark sorceries the Republic Warlock wielded were not unlike the psychic abilities known in his galaxy. Tar had underestimated him, had held back and preserved himself from his most potent techniques in a mistaken belief that his superiority over this dark figure would be like that of the other Jedi. Clearly that was not the case, and the moment his foe now offered him would allow the Inquisitor to recuperate his strength and examine his options. Even if the tension between them remained thick enough to cut with a monomolecular edge. As I see it, your potential is squandered, Inquisitor. The sorcerer resumed when Tar said nothing, his voice a sibilant whisper that carried more than a hint of menace. You are powerful, so powerful, and yet you falter. You fail. Tar's face creased. Your words will find no purchase here. Your lies are meaningless. The Inquisitor hissed. You are a mere road bump, barely a true hindrance. With every moment that passes, I grow closer to my victory. And your pathetic Republic draws nearer to its doom. What? You think that because some of your Jedi techniques can stall for time, it means anything? The Imperium will not be stopped! I cannot be stopped! Not by false men, or politicians, or your witch warriors, and your precious, weakling Jedi Order! Tar snarled, his eyes narrowing in tight, channeled hatred, before suddenly being brought up short, his words choking from his mouth. He reached up to his throat, fingers scrabbling at a bind he could not reach. And, eyes wide, he realized his mistake. He had allowed this old man to get into his head, to create through frustration and anger a pin-sized opening in Tar's mental defenses. One which the sorcerer had shattered open in wreathing Tar in a noose of telekinetic power. But soon it became apparent that Tar had not been the only one frustrated. A spark of uncontrolled anger flared in the witch's eyes. A churning sea suddenly whipped into a tempest behind the fires held within each iris. Your ignorance is becoming difficult to tolerate, Tar Weiler of the Imperium. So much so that it appears I must begin your education before formality can be observed. Hear this, know this, and remember well your first lesson. Spoke the Dark Lord, stepping forward, one hand extended out, gesturing as though gripping an invisible throat. Tar struggled, his feet leaving the ground as he was raised off his legs, held by his throat as a torrent of malevolent energy seared him invisibly. He was not only being choked, but crushed, and not just physically. He tried to calm his mind. Duels, even against gods, could be won if their opponent knew how to throw them off balance and into a precarious situation. Tar had been lured into just such a trap, and panicking or losing control to fury or pain would not save him while he was trapped in this vice. Slowly, but surely, Tar began to build his strength again, sliding it like slick fingers under the coils of the witch's constricting might. I am no Jedi, and my order is not to be compared to theirs. The sorcerer spat, his voice laced with indignation as Tar gasped and hung in the air before him. I am the Sith Lord of this galaxy, a master of the dark side of the Force, a lineage distinguished and separate from the simpering idealists you dare to mistake me for. Conflate us at your own peril, for I shall not forgive such ignorance a second time. 
the Inquisitor grit his teeth, glaring at the Dark Lord, noting the Sith's fleeting loss of self-control and taking advantage of it. Your synaptics mean little to me. Your labels will be forgotten by history. Tar growled and gasped past his clenched, shark-like teeth. A bright light surrounded his throat as he pushed with his considerable strength against the Sith Lord. The witch did not seem perturbed by the effort, for no one had ever escaped this technique by their own might, at least not in the Sith's experience. That experience changed as the blue ring of light suddenly seemed to expand and burst all at once, rupturing the telekinetic bond violently and driving a pained hiss from the Sorcerer Lord, his hand cracking and twisting agonizingly. Tarweiler dropped to his feet, extending his hands out in his own brutally powerful telekinetic vice, slamming kilotons of force into his rival, both from above, his sides, his back, and his front. But this creature did not crumple into nothing, did not even fold like Ayla Sakura had. Tarweiler exerted himself more powerfully, veins bulging, but the Sith Lord did not even waver, even as the ground beneath his feet buckled and the tower split and melted around the spot. Tar felt his heart racing, for he was truly exerting himself, atoms smashing in sparks that nearly became nuclear detonations from the pressure he exerted. And yet, there he stood, smiling, unbothered. How was it possible? How powerful was this Sith Lord to shrug off such a force? And then Tar felt it, a hand resting upon the back of his head, fingers extending over his scalp, grasping gently as the illusion he had been trying to destroy vanished before his eyes like a desert mirage brought close. Tar ceased his exerting, heart beating in his ears. When had the Sith Lord slipped away? How had he not noticed, not seen? You know, deep inside, the Witch Lord said, voice resonating as if from inside Tar's own head. That you cannot succeed, hissed the Sith Lord. Tar felt sweat building on his bald head between the fingers laid across his pale, cranial skin. Was he fast enough? Was he powerful enough to stop him even now? Even gods could be slain and devoured by mere children if conditions were met. This Tar knew well. But you do not have to stand against me, whispered the Dark Lord. You can kneel. You can learn. Tarweiler struggled to control his breathing, his heart's own hammering, making hearing the words alone difficult. He sighed out a hiss, dropping his hands slowly to his sides, his left falling over a specific part of his robe. There, within an inner pocket, was a device which may yet save him. But he could not reach it directly. Feeling his guts roil with tension, Tar began to speak as his left hand slowly closed around the vague imprint of the object, gradually squeezing it, trying to activate it. Betray the Emperor. Betray mankind. Do you think you are the first witch to try to tempt me from the path? Tar spoke each word enunciated with cold clarity, challenging the Sith Lord even now, hoping to keep his focus. Ah, loyalty and duty, such noble concepts, but even they have their price. The witch whispered, drawing closer, his voice resonant. You're no stranger to the corruption that eats away at your Imperium. The st- 
stagnation, the ineffable sense that it is all crumbling away. With me, you could not only save it, but reshape it, rule it. That is impossible. The Imperium of Man serves only the Emperor, the Emperor's son and Lord Commander, and the Inquisition which safeguards it. No one man has controlled the Imperium for over 10,000 years. If it is not the Emperor, then it is not possible. Tar shot back, his voice tinged with an emotion he seldom allowed. Temptation. Tar Weiler felt the weight of the Sith's grasp tighten. Ah, are you truly too beguiled by the illusion of untouchable divinity? The Witch Lord murmured, his words seeming to echo. Even gods can be supplanted, Inquisitor, through the power of the dark side. All things are possible. As the heretic spoke, Tar felt the object in his pocket pressing against his palm, his fingers squeezing tighter and tighter, sliding over it, looking for the activation rune on its elliptical shape. He internally cursed Eldar finger strength and continued to squeeze as he replied. Only a fool replaces one god for another, believing that his new master will liberate him. Tar responded, his tone a calculated blend of disdain and reluctant curiosity, as if the very idea nauseated him even while it intrigued. I am not asking you to trade gods, Tar Weiler. I am asking you to open your eyes and realize that you could become a god, that you deserve to become a god, that anything less would be unworthy of you. Hissed the Sorcerer Lord. You make impressive promises, but even large words are cheaply made within the Imperium. I am a lord. I am master of countless... Tar Weiler began to say, You are an expendable asset, one which must hide his true power and his right to divinity to appease a culture of backward savages. The Witch Lord replied swiftly, cutting through Tar Weiler's words. The Emperor might not even recognize your sacrifice, your unending service, but I would. Under my tutelage, you would wield the sort of power that eclipses what the God Emperor would ever deem to grant you. Search your feelings, Inquisitor Weiler. You know this to be true. As the Sith's words sought to corrode his loyalty, Tar Weiler felt his fingerprints finally compress the rune on the Eldar jump disc which was concealed in his inner pocket. A sensation like an icy breeze blew over him, tingling his spine. As soon as he released the button, it would activate, likely for the last time. I have seen the ruin that follows men who trade loyalty for promises of power. Their souls scream in a rightly earned and perpetual damnation. Tar spat making sure every syllable carried the weight of irrefutable fact. I will not be one of them! Tar released his grip on the device just as he felt the Witch Lord's grasp tighten once more, sinking his nails painfully into Tar Weiler's bald scalp, as if the Sith Lord had sensed the impending turn. The universe folded in on itself for a mere second in Tar Weiler's eyes, and the Inquisitor vanished from the Sith's grasp, reappearing thirty feet away, body smoking somewhat, and five shallow, bloody red lines drawn over his skull. Tar turned and grinned. Some of the skin around his neck burnt into twisting lines, but not by much. Some blood still dripped from the Sith's fingers as he turned to face the Inquisitor, the Sith's hand still outstretched. Weiler flared his nostrils as he sensed the confusion and then dark anger of the Sith Lord, whose lips scrunched as he snarled like a predator denied its kill. That was close! 
Tar Weiler exclaimed, standing now at a distance, his telepathic barriers fortified once more. But unlike you, it's not mere tricks and ambition that sustain me. It is conviction. A shadow flitted across the Sorcerer Lord's eyes. Conviction. I too have conviction. The conviction required to remold the universe itself. Your parlor tricks will not save you, regardless of what you choose to call them. The Witch Lord retorted, but the snarl that had accentuated his malevolence was curiously absent now. Silence! I will hear no more from you! Your words and your lies, they are nothing but distractions! And I do not want to be distracted when I am pulling your wretched body apart! Tar Weiler sneered, his physical body gripping his black rapier with renewed vigor. Come for me, sorcerer! Show me the power of this force you think you control! Challenged the Inquisitor. Both warriors squared their shoulders, bracing for the next furious exchange. The space between them felt more charged than ever before, like an even larger tempest was about to be unleashed. However, just before that storm could break, a new aberration emerged. Out from the shadows of the twisted broken tower, and behind Tar's back, a skittering mechanism of gears and circuits burst forth. Omni Kraden extended his metallic limbs into a myriad of directions. Moving even as he launched himself, body angling to catch the Inquisitor's profile. Before he even understood what had happened, Tar was encased once again. This time not by the forceful grasp of the Sith Lord, but by the cold, unyielding appendages of the Tech Priest. Before the Witch could even attempt to counter, Omni Kraden's array of mechanized limbs constricted, pulling Tar into its mist like an arachnid securing its prey. In those same moments, a mechanical whirr sounded, whining while an industrial antenna emerged from the centipede-like mechanoid's back, extending skyward and flashing from its bulb-like tip. Clearly, this had been prepared beforehand, for while the Sith moved quickly, raising his arms and hands to fire forth a deadly stream of warp lightning, he did not move quite quickly enough. A wave of ethereal energy pulsated from the mechanism the antenna had extended from. A distant teleportarium coming to life, already locked onto the coordinates. The air distorted, waving as if in intense heat, a sickening rainbow of colors flashing from the spot just as the lightning reached them. And then, in a burst of disorienting sound and sensations, both Omni Kraden and Tarweiler vanished, leaving behind only the echoes of a battle left unfinished. Darth Sidious looked at the spot where his would-be apprentice had stood just moments before. His left fist clenched, not from the flushed feelings of any defeat, but from the realization that his suddenly disrupted game may yet prove interesting in its own novel way. The Inquisitor had been tested had been offered power and shown enough of it to whet his appetite. Now, all the Dark Lord needed to do was wait and see if his seedling, so carefully planted, bore fruit. Left alone among the ruins, the Witch Lord of the Galactic Republic, the secret Dark Master, of the Jedi Order saw that he was still not truly alone. 
unconscious or dead Jedi, yet lay strewn about the corrupted heights of the tower he and Tarweiler had formed in the process of their spiritual and telekinetic battle. Most notably of all, Ayla Sakura, now passed from the waking world, yet lived, and Sidious knew she had seen him. Perhaps she had not been able to piece together that he had come as part of the Republic's response, but he doubted even the Jedi were so blind as to not notice his timing. He briefly considered slaying her, here and now, and quickly, before he departed. None would question it. All would lay it at the feet of Tarweiler and the Imperium. Yet he stayed his hand, absorbing the scene fully. A crooked smile slid over his face, seeing that he had planted two seedlings here, not one. If the Jedi threatened his plans, he had ample ways of dealing with her. And if she sprouted and grew the dark fruit he had planted, then she would be worth the risk many times over. Sidious was not the greatest tactician in the galaxy, but he was the greatest planner and schemer the stars had ever seen. And already he could sense what role her careful placement might fulfill in the future. And so, standing amidst the debris of a battle interrupted, the Sith Lord resolved to take no more lives. New moves awaited, and his galactic game of Dejeric was far from over, even as the opening gambits met their conclusions. But there were still one or two more moves to play out. This Sidious felt with no uncertainty his eyes arcing up towards a ship in the far distant sky, so distant as it drifted in orbit that it could not be plainly seen at all. There, in the void, invisible, but so, so close, darkness was spreading, was taking root, and it was not just there either. Sidious then turned his burning yellow eyes towards the horizon. Viewing from his tower the streak of arterial red which had been left behind by a blood-drenched storm. Like a crimson road carved through the spires of Axum's planet-wide city, leading towards a howling tempest which was, like the ship, far beyond his physical view, but well within the reach of his preternatural senses. This was only the first battle, but as with all opening moves, it, once concluded, would set the stage for the rest of the game. Already fates had shifted irrevocably, both in this dimension and in others nearby. There was no going back now, and embracing the power of change, Sidious straightened his robe and began to make his way towards the edge of the tower. He was the master behind this war, the Republic, and the Empire that would rise in its wake. By this, he would shape and control the future through his strength and new, twisting schemes. The galaxy would yet be his, the Dark Lord knew, for over all of the many things he was, from duelist to sorcerer and liar to leader, Darth Sidious was, above all other things, an architect. But not of wood, stone, or steel. No, nothing so mundane. Darth Sidious crafted using only the most powerful and the most potent of building materials. What he gave rise to through his construction would stand the test of time far greater than any single building ever could. For here, in his galaxy, Palpatine was the architect of nothing less than fate, and none would usurpate his glorious 
design. Yeah. 
I think your indifference is a crime. 